Uh, this week's uh, discussion is about the virya paramita. So very loosely translated as the energy perfection. Um, but that's a fairly narrow translation, as we'll see. But uh, let's get into, the, get into the first slide. Thanks so much. So um, to, to begin, uh, first a little bit about the paramita themselves. Um, and uh, um, the, the, here we have a list of six. Um, in some versions, there are uh, as many as 10 perfections. Um, uh, in early Pali texts, uh, there are ten, uh, 10 qualities. Um, and later Mahayana texts actually have 10, ten um, qualities as well, although they don't coincide. So go figure. But for our purposes, for most of Mahayana um, practice of the six paramita um, are these six. Um, so we'll be using that for this evening. Um, and so these uh, are <coughs> things that the practitioner can use as um, trainings, as guides toward the goal of awakening. They are a source of building character, um, a way to live the path of awakening, um, further and further embodying each characteristic to its perfection. So each paramita builds upon the previous, culminating in the perfection of wisdom, implying then that each of the previous five are further per perfected even more. That is to say that we start by practicing dana, often translated as generosity, uh, but here I label it as giving, as a distinction not of just time, uh, as a distinction of not just time and money, but really giving of oneself bringing all that you can selflessly give in any given moment. That um, doing of giving can develop a stronger sense of shila, of ethical living, having a stronger moral compass, for example. And a more ethical mindset, in turn, helps, the practice, uh, helps to practice um, a more developed, meaningful sense of giving. These two then give rise to the importance of kashanti, forbearance, patience. And this perpetuating reflective cycle continues as we deepen and refine those characteristics. These admirable qualities are ideals, something we can always work to better. The word perfection, um, however, can sometimes muddy our conceptualization of, of what the goal, uh, the, the purpose, uh, the, the practice of these paramita. So self-cultivation is at the heart of Buddhist practice and, and a deliberate choice and perspective and purpose to, <clears throat> to live a certain way, not an endpoint that quote unquote perfection can often imply. And as Wright, uh, Wright if the, people don't know Dale Wright, he wrote a great book about the six paramitas. I'll be referencing it a lot. Um, he describes it, quote, although circumstances beyond anyone's control will make very different possibilities available for different people, Buddhists have always recognized that the difference between those who assume the task of self-sculpting with imagination, integrity, and courage, and those who do not, is enormous. Constituting in Buddhism the difference between enlightened ways of being in the world and unenlightened ways. And Luther goes on to say that, that all beings change in complex ways, that nothing is fixed or static, and that, like everything else, the path of enlightenment is open and ongoing without end. The quest for enlightenment is ongoing not because we never attain greater insight or comprehension, but because in ascending to a higher level, we become capable of envisioning something even greater beyond what we currently where we currently stand. My daughter likes to call the six paramitas a good to-do list. I, I like that too. I mean, you know. Um, but the point here is that if anything else, taking these paramita as something to work towards, by its nature, helps us to refine and strengthen any character. This would be a small example of demonstrating that the doing of the path with intention and purpose is the path of awakening. 
as we perfect these qualities, we strengthen our character and develop our, as Wright puts it, the thought of enlightenment. Uh, he relates it to the Greek notion of the ideal for a good life, uh, but I might personally label it as bodhicitta, the, the seed of awakening, that thought of awakening, that which gives drive to be and do better, an awakening of the Buddha nature that lies in all of us. This idea of bodhicitta will become very important later, but in this, um, in this quote, task of the self-sculpting, the paramita can become a basis for one's Buddhist practice. Throughout Buddhist history, the paramita have held an important place within the Buddha Dharma, being found both in Theravada, um, Southeast Asia um, Buddhism, and Mahayana teachings in much of East, A East Asia. Um, in fact, when we find them um, mentioned in some of the earliest Pali texts, notably the Chautauqua Tales, um, which tells the stories of the numerous lives of Shakyamuni Buddha before becoming Siddhartha Gautama. Um, slide. So as some of you may remember um, from a couple months ago, a conversation about the Dhammapada, um, within the Pali Triptaka, there are the three groups, uh, the three uh, um, baskets, uh, the Triptaka, um, the Vinaya, the Suttas, and the Abhidhamma. The Vinaya are the ethical code, the, the kind of the precepts all written out, very formulaic um, uh, rules to abide by. The suttas are the sutras, the teachings, the, the words of Shakyamuni Buddha, and um, the Abhidharma being the commentary and writings of others um, during that same time to uh, further illustrate that teaching. So within the suttas basket, within that um, part of the Triptaka, there are the five, uh, the five collections, the Nikayas. Um, and so the last one, the fifth one being the Kudaka Nikaya. So here, this is kind of the minor collection. Again, it, it's, a, it's an amalgam or a, almost an addendum to all the other uh, collections. But these, the, the group can, consists of some of the earliest and some of the latest of the Pali texts. So in this particular group, you see the Dhammapada up on the top there, underlined, um, but so also included as the Jataka tales, um, and both being examples of some of the earliest texts. Um, so just like, please, thank you. Um, but what I want to highlight um, in these tales momentarily is because the, they represent the important place the Paramita hold in relation to the ethical history of Buddhism. Each tale is about the many lifetimes that preceded that of Siddhartha Gautama, Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, the Buddha practiced the Paramita in his previous lives when he was, as he was a Bodhisattva. Um, the Bodhisattva uh, that has put off his awakening um, and continues to be reborn in, this, in the realm of samsara, the realm of rebirth, um, for the benefit of others, um, postponing his own enlightenment. So he's, he's the Bodhisattva traveling through time, the many lifetimes, practicing the paramita, because the goal of which is the, the total purification to eventually attaining samyak sambodhi, the, the fully... Uh, if, fully complete awakening um, during the lifetime uh, as Siddhartha Gautama. Um, in, in each story, it shows that the Bodhisattva practiced the Paramita in every form during these lives, and therefore showing that spiritual perfection is related to ethical and moral action. Each tale is an exploration and representation of each characteristic needing perfecting along the way to realizing full enlightenment. So before there, full awakening. So before there was Shakyamuni Buddha, um, there were lifetimes of bodhisattvas working to perfect themselves so that they could be eventually Siddhartha Gautama, who is eventually able to lift the veil and become awakened and become Shakyamuni Buddha. The tale also demonstrates the embodiment of the bodhisattva ideal. There is um, there are many stories because there are many stories because there are many bodhisattva lives being retold. Um, and so that, and characterizing many of the characteristics needed to be, um, uh, needed to be, uh, uh, characterized. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it implies that, that they, they don't, ha that, that they actively chose not to follow the Arhat path. That those Buddhas during those lives chose not to, um, give way to their own self-awakening. So the Arhat path is that of self-awakening. Achieving nirvana, the elimination of suffering for oneself, the existing and, and the exiting of samsara, the cycle of rebirth. So, because if any of those bodhisattvas had chosen arhatship, 
they would have ex exited the cycle of rebirth, and the story of Buddhism would have ended there. Mm -hmm. um, no fully awakened Shakyamuni Buddha. Meaning, they chose the harder path. They chose to dedicate themselves to alleviating suffering, not just for themselves, but for all. And therefore manifesting and the practice of following the, the um, virya paramita. Um, and this active choice to keep going is as good of a segue as any to go on to the next. Um, so here we are with the, the, the virya paramita. Um, we have no great translation, surprise, surprise, of virya. So generally we use energy. Um, but by convention, it has come to represent concepts like strength, power, heroism, effort, fortitude, courage, firmness, vigor, enthusiasm, strenuousness, zeal, diligence. Okay. Um, it can be described as selflessly engaging in and accomplishing wholesome, virtuous actions. But this particular paramita is at an interesting divide. Um, being the fourth, it, it's, it's the, the first of the second group of three. So the first group of three per perfections um, versus the last three. And we could imagine that the first three, um, uh, this, that is Dana gener uh, giving um, Sheila ethics and Kishanti patients, um, are on one level. Um, and the second three on a different level? I wouldn't say higher level per se. Um, maybe more involved. Um, so we might conceptualize uh, it as more as more for the, the latter the latter three more for practitioners, monks, nuns, um, and others who give priority in their lives to spiritual practice and insight, because these latter three paramita help to heighten the level of spiritual awareness of the previous three. The, the first three can seem easier to perform and requires less selflessness, um, but. This fourth, uh, this fourth step is critical in the trans in transition of deepening one's practice. Having practiced uh, the, the first three, now we develop a purposeful drive to do those first three, now with the addition of vigor. To say nothing of the fact that to perfect the fifth and sixth paramita, it requires the fourth, energy and dedication. And so what we initially set out to do as we start on the Buddhist path will change as we practice those final three, uh, the first three, Dana, Sheila, and Kashanti. Uh, then as we add virya, the difference in outcomes from our practice, from our practice is enormous. It's, it's the shift that provides the context to practice the, uh, to practice the first three much more profoundly. And in doing so, will reinforce one's definition of their own quality of virya finding new sources and manifestations of that virya. However, Wright makes, makes an important point um, by saying, stating that the Western concept of energy has never been one of ethical meaning or as a name of, of virtue of how to be. Even someone being energetic can have ne negative connotations. A distinction can help to illustrate the ethical paradigm of virya. We, we, we can fail. We can fail um, ethically, and we can fail in ethically in two ways, positively and negatively. Um, in the negative, we can be outright nasty. We cannot be a great person, period, right? We're, we're, uh, bad, we do bad things for self and others. Uh, we are a destructive force in general, right? But on the positive, on the other hand, we can fail positively, meaning that by not living well enough, a lack of healthy motivation towards good. Um, therefore, failing to live a life worthy of what we are actually able to do. It is not, it, it, so it's, it is the not arousing, that energy, that is the failing. Not practicing that energy becomes an ethical issue. Imagine two people, both of equal thoughtfulness, compassion, selflessness, etc. But one does not practice virya, and the other does. So, when something is done, although both are compassionate and selfless, the former can come off as meek, 
again, in compa only in comparison to them being carried out with vigor and resolve. Viria is considered one of, uh, one of the seven factors for awakening. It is an antidote um, to an all too common hindrance of the five hindrances of sloth and torpor. My favorite. So good. I mean, I'm sure we can all relate you know, with the laughter in the room. Because um, if it's not constant, at least at points in our lives, have we been hindered by being slothful or tor torporish? I don't know. Torpors. Torpors. Torpor yeah, yeah. Torpor. <laughs> the other, so the only way out is to rouse some semblance of area. Okay. It, it helps. <laughs> it's a nice impetus, right? There's got to be some follow through, though, hopefully. Um, certainly gets the engine revving. But that, that, that's what we're going to call our our dark plane area. <laughs> the, <laughs> um, the dark plane. So <clears throat> because. It, it, it's in the doing of virya. We are, we are practicing virya, and as we practice, we realize more, deepen our experience of it, and are able to tap into something far more than what was normally expected. Um, uh, to quote right again, um, in earlier epics, virya um, pointed to the power and virility of the warrior. The one noted for physical strength and courage, the hero of epic battles. Evolving through the history of um, Brahmanical culture, it came to signify prowess of other kinds, the energy and exertion necessary to make extraordinary accomplishments possible. Early Buddhist texts referred to the Buddhist himself as a vira, a great hero, the one who was victorious over the forces of evil, Mara, and whose spiritual achievements would transform the world. For Buddhists, therefore, virya meant the energy of accomplishment, the effort, courage, and power to see spiritual endeavor through to its completion. Virya Paramita is the perfection of this energy, the power of unyielding commitment to the ultimate goal of universal awakening. But what do we have as means of learning or techniques to develop virya? Not a whole lot. Um, even though we may might assume that the, there were practices being circulated, instead, within the teachings, they seem to be much more um, inspirational rhetoric. You know, go get them. Why, why are you wasting your life, right? Encouraging discussions and, and the like. Um, not necessarily formal practices um, in and of themselves. Um, and those, but, but those teachings, no doubt, did inspire and encourage uh, many things. Um, but maybe more importantly, to what extent can one's energy be transformed? And, and through what techniques might that be accomplished? And I'm going to leave that open-ended. I, I, because that's the practice. That's how we find out. That's how we experience virya. Um, slide, please. So from here... Um, I'll talk about some various characteristics of Virya. Uh, first and foremost, physical and mental. Um, there is an understanding that physical energy is always required, but very few practices are given to build or perfect physical energy. I might think of like the Shaolin monk in this perspective, but really, even there, it's not like there's something that says, it's almost as a way to get over the body or get, put the body out of the way, rather than actually emboldening the body. Um, but there is an understanding that physical endeavor should be one aspect of Buddhist practice. Sitting in meditation, not falling asleep, takes energy. <laughs> Moreover, mental energy is typically considered more consequential. We need mental energy to withstand dukkha, um, suffering, discontentedness, <laughs> discontentedness, and even more to develop a mindset of a desire to overcome dukkha and an aspiration for good. Mental energy is needed for all aspects of self-sculpting. I like that. I like self-sculpting. Um, the, the engagement, the introspection, being open, receptive, flexible, yet unyielding, uh, and always changing for the better. Change. Change takes mental energy. It takes focus and attention and purposefulness and breaking bad habits and instilling new habits. It all takes mental energy. Um, but if we 
trees, um, then or extra ordinary and extraordinary. This is a way to see virya along stages of, a, of this perfection. We can have general mundane practices of virya, and then there's the perfected forms. The, the practice of virya on a more selfish, more self-understanding level, at least, helps one to embolden and power on through difficulty when it arrives. Because, um, you know, life, that, that thing that we're dealing with, um, ordinary stuff. Uh, and, and so it's things like, I'll start meditating for the benefit of my practice. I'm working on alleviating my weaknesses. So, but then we have examples of virya going above and beyond normal conception to the level of dedicating one's wholesome acts and extending that benefit to all others without the thought of needing energy for the completion of whatever task. This implies that we can't know what we're capable of. When practice, the extraordinary is possible, though the idea of it and how much virya is needed will always change until no explicit virya is needed at all. And that's probably more with the development and perfection of wisdom, but um, click this. Um, then we have emotional energy. Um, although emotions tend to be somewhat mistrusted in Buddhism, um, there are many uh, that are important elements of an awakened life. Um, compassion, joy, wonder are all essential, but need to be shaped and refined and, and cultivated. Um, keeping an awareness on the expression and level uh, of our responses helps to manage and lessen emotional volatility and possible destructiveness. Being able to change and adapt rather than be consumed and confused. We cannot allow these goals and aspirations that are not of wholesome nature. We cannot afford to have our energies sapped for, from false motivations. The, the bodhisattva path is so enduring and so difficult, we have to have fury, just simply as to not get disparaged or intimidated. Emotional maturity founded on bodhicitta, the seed of awakening, is presumably less vulnerable, uh, is less vulnerable to extremes of emotion. Therefore, virya is required in the attentive development of our emotional responsiveness. Finally, courage. Um, our capacity to face fear uh, is, a foundation, is foundational to the development of virya. It becomes a strength of character. Um, and is an influential antidote to spiritual weakness. Our courage allows us to risk what we have, uh, what we have for the prospect of something greater, something better. Courage as a concept can stand alone as a translation for virya because it seems um, to be a prominent way in which um, virya manifests. Um, <clears throat> if we consider one of the um, marks of existence and permanence, we, we assume um, the constant flux, never knowing what comes next. That inherent fear is something we face every day and hopefully overcome. But nevertheless, even that small example needs to be named as fear. We also, um, we will, because we will always have fear and therefore it is how we respond to it that defines our fear. These are some, these are just some of the aspects but what I, what I hope is that I, I've painted at least a picture of, of what var, um, uh, Viria is, what it can be, its importance, etc. Because it is important. Um, as, as I mentioned before, there is very little in the form um, of specific practices that help generate Viria, other than simply practicing the path. This reminds me of the discussion we, uh, that I led uh, about faith along the Bodhisattva path. The way to cultivate faith was to do the practice, where, where the paramita were actually explicitly mentioned as, as that practice. <coughs> um, um, excuse me, as I lost my place. Um, and this, uh, and so it, the way to cultivate the faith is through, um, the, uh, through doing the practice. So it is the doing. It is the developing of self-cultivation by practicing the six perfections um, and it, that becomes the very meaning of awakening. Awakening is, is just the doing of the path, and the, the, because the path is the awakening. So all we can do is do it, and do it well. Do it intentionally, do it perfectly.
purposefully. Um, if we follow the, uh, the paramita well, virya is provided, practiced, and perfected. In this way, practicing the paramita are a continuous model that we can follow, uh, uh, that we can forever strive towards. Therefore, the, the polishing, purification, and refinement of ourselves allows bodhicitta, the seed of awakening, um, to manifest. This, in turn, can be the very source of more virya. And I think of Job's comment, which plays over and over in my head all the time. Let the bodhicitta take the lead. Let that spark take control. Wright brings this up repeatedly. The importance of what he called the thought of enlightenment, and what I'm calling the bodhicitta. We have, we have, been, uh, we have to be guided by that thought of awakening. It spurs us on by giving purpose, direction, and perspective. But we have to have more than just the thought of it. We also need to cultivate, it needs to be cultivated through action um, to, to let it take the lead. We need energy to make that choice, to carry it out, to actively cultivate. We have to do. We need that drive, that purpose, to help us be inspired and motivated. Our thought of awakening enables us to keep going, keep striving, to be aware of our heading and correct accordingly. It can necessitate shifts in our mindset about our own practice to something that is even more committed, more driven, more diligent. An example of this would be to do something like, think of the fir that first feeling. Think of the moment that you encountered the Buddha Dharma in a meaningful way for the first time. It, it, it's that first time it really kind of sinks in. And it doesn't have to be about the Buddha Dharma. It's, it, it could be anything that you've encountered in your life, a moment in time that helps you solidify some concept of it's worth it to be good. We all, hopefully, have some moment like that. And to recall that and keep recalling that as much as it takes. We all have to remember that first feeling to remember our ambitions, our purpose, our motivation, especially when things are tough. Because that's when it's most needed. Being able to recall the reasons why we started on the path can provide a meaningful resource of virya. In the doing of the path, we gain faith, we are motivated, we work on perfecting ourselves, for the benefit of others, and therefore, in the doing, lift the veil of our awakening. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. um, let's uh, go to the next slide, please, for questions, comments, oh. thoughts. I will first. Going back here. I do want to just pause and and, and allow uh, Munchu Sensei and uh, or Ichishima Sensei to make any comments that they might want to add to the discussion. Ichishima Sensei, do you have any comments? Oh, I'm sorry, Sensei, uh, you were muted. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think uh, this virya is very important. Uh, there is a saying, practice makes perfect. So uh, this is a very important perfections mm -hmm. among six perfections. And the, uh, there are many divisions how to divide this uh, grouping. For instance, uh, uh, be, uh, kai jo e. Kai is uh, shira, and jo is dhyana, and uh, e wisdom is prajna. So these are basic uh, studies. And the other things uh, from one to five, dana, sira, kshanti, virya, dhyana. This is the uh, uh, group that's uh, upaya, uh, according to Kamara Shira. And this upaya, Plus, prajna makes uh, moksha. Moksha is uh, uh, satori enlightenment. <laughs> so enlightenment needs wisdom and uh, upaya. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, the, the theory of the 
uh, Mahayana Buddhism. And also uh, Paramita is called Paramita Yana uh, for the Mahayana. Mahayana is a Paramita Yana. So always making effort like that. I think uh, this is uh, important to, uh, to have understanding this kind of uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shinsensei. Thank you, Sensei. Um, and so, for, and just so, just quickly, um, some of those <coughs> those terms, um, uh, the prajnayana would be like the vehicle of uh, the paramita yana would be like the, the vehicle of using the paramita within the mahayana, right? Um, and he used the use the term upaya, which is skillful means, um, along with prajna wisdom. Um, so uh, those are the uh, three: so karuna, um, upaya, and uh, prajna. Compassion, skillful means of wisdom. That's very quick. Sorry. What I was going to, I was just going to comment. You had physical and mental as the characteristics of virya, and just a an example of that is that when we're meditating, I'll see people in the hondo, and how many people are sitting there in meditation, and I see them doing this. <laughs> Or I see them doing this, <laughs> or leaning up against the pole, or whatever, or sleeping. Or I hear them snoring, and that's the physical part because there's three parts to meditation. There's the posture, there's the breath, and then there's what goes on with the mind. And so the physical, if the physical isn't correct, the mind is never going to be correct. The mind can't be correct without the physical. And so if you're sitting there and you're doing this, you're wasting your time. And I, I can't emphasize enough when I, and that's what I think about when I see people in the hondo and I see people doing this, you know, they're just sitting, you know, and I'm thinking, Virya, <laughs> energy, let's go, pick it up, <laughs> you know, get a cup of dark roast, Virya, <laughs> which we sell in our shop. No, <laughs>